What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Through the Monocle. I'm the co-host of this show, Grant Skillen, and this week's episode is going to be a little different than it's been in the past. Uh, Grant and I aren't able to do our normal type of show this week, so instead we're going to bring you our interview with Mr. Carl Newman. He was the movement double for the Batman movie in 1989. Fantastic guy, fantastic interview. Uh, this is from our other show, Much Talk About Nothing. Go check it out if you haven't. Um, I know that you'll enjoy it. Great guy, like I said, and without further ado, here we go. So, Grant, I know you have the list of questions that we've kind of put together. Um, do you want to start that off? Yeah, so I guess my first question is, what did you do in your career before you were in the Batman movie? Yeah, so I was a professional dancer. Um, I'd gone and uh, I trained at a very reputable um, college performing arts called Lane Theatre Arts in Epsom in Surrey. I'd done three years there and all fast. Of, of dance, the whole spectrum, with um, acting and singing as well. And one thing the college also encouraged you to do was to get out and get some work, and then um, you could add to your equity card, which is your union card in, in the UK here. And once I started doing that, I was picking up some work. I graduated, getting more work. Um, just doing a variety of great things. So I could do television, film, video, pop videos, commercials, theater, trade shows, the whole the whole spectrum really, which was fantastic. But but also prior to to Batman and college, I was this guy that absolutely loved music. Um, so to begin with, I was actually playing the drums. Uh, I've been passionate with, with the drums from the age of 11, probably even before, but I started to take lessons from the age of 11, um, playing with various bands and, and uh, orchestras and groups. And then the dance kind of came in from there, that a dance school spotted me doing some stuff and I was encouraged to do more. But I'd also been very sporty. My late father had uh, encouraged me with keeping fit and doing weight training and, and uh, weight lifting. But I, I did everything at school. I did all the various sports. So I was a very passionate guy, you know, who also got involved with some athletic clubs as well. So I was a very busy guy, you know, doing all these different things. And funny enough, Batman was something that I loved as a kid. You know, the 60s uh, TV series was there. I was uh, a big fan of that. You know, I wanted one of those red phones. <laughs> um, you know, I loved the Batcave and, and, the, and the car. I thought the actors were, were fantastic, the whole feel. And look what happened. You know, my, my sort of dream came true. It really did, yeah. So how how excited were you? And kind of how how did you end up being the double for Batman? Because how did that come together? It was very surreal, actually, Grom, because um, I was sharing digs with a guy, and uh, I'd had this phone call from my agents, an agent called Dancers, and they were the very first agents in, in London to to get set up, and they called me and. I sort of heard the brief, if you like, but I hadn't got the right, quite the right angle. But I, I went along to Pinewood Studios and I met first assistant director, Derek Cracknell. So I met him. We spoke about the movie and how exciting it was to have a film like this being made in England and at the world famous Pinewood Studios. I went away from that meeting and then didn't hear anything for, for some time. And then I ended up staying at another uh, digs with uh, a group of uh, dance students. And then I got that wonderful phone call where they said, Carl, we need you to come in, try the suit on, show us what you can do. So I was really hyped and pumped from that phone call. I shot into Pinewood Studios. It was wonderful because I met the wardrobe team there was there was Vin Burnham who sculpted the cow there was uh, William Todd Jones who and Dave Merch who were both uh, bat, bat suit wranglers I met them and we really clicked and, and I think they were very very happy how I looked in the suit and they were especially happy how the cow fitted me because I got the right sort of jawline and everything the chin 
Um, and then it was quite bizarre because I put the full Batman regalia on and there wasn't really a huge amount I could do. They said, well, look, go down the corridors, um, get a feel for it. So I was running up and down these corridors. As you can imagine, I was in some kind of dream, you know, this most amazing feeling. There I'm in the most iconic, fantastic Batman suit, everything on. I ran up and down these corridors. Uh, it was like an out-of-body experience or something. And then I went back to wardrobe and just waited. And then uh, one of the other assistant uh, directors came, said, right, Carl, we're ready for you. Took me in one of my little golf buggies to uh, the Gotham back lot, which was absolutely amazing. I mean, as you probably know, it was about a mile and a half half long this recreation of Gotham City wow. Wow. in this gold buggy they they sort of dropped me off there that's when I met Tim which was just amazing you know to, to meet a guy like him who, who I, I admired his work uh, previously uh, with Beetlejuice etc and Pee Wee but then he was so lovely and he, he just wanted me to show what I could do in the suit so I was just throwing myself around running, jumping, doing leaps, whatever I could do just to show my versatility, my, my athleticism, if you like. So, yeah, I, I was I was sort of so excited, but also I was trying to contain things because we know what it's like when you go on castings and, and um, you know, meetings, whatever, that you don't want to get ahead of yourself. Um, and I was just waiting. I just felt quietly, well, more than quietly, but very confident inside because I just thought, you know, I've got all the attributes here. I've, I've got the physical sort of attributes, the sporting background, the dance background. I knew I looked right and how I held myself. And I just waited on the sidelines and they tapped me on the shoulder and said, we'd like you to stay. And it was kind of like everything was jumping inside the whole excitement, but but not again, not trying to get probably a bit of English reserve there, you know, just okay. trying to contain that utter sheer electricity and excitement that hey, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm here, I'm, I'm going to be doing this. But I think also with the way that things were handled, they they were just gauging things. They didn't sort of say outright, look, Carl, we want you here for 12 weeks, 16 weeks, whatever. They they just kind of gave me the gig. My agent then got the contract to, to a degree and they were sort of employing me so many weeks at a time. But it was absolutely incredible. And I think coincidentally as well for me was that I'd been filming there Prior to Batman, um, I'd been working on on another uh, filming job because dancers get used an awful lot, um, as we know, through TV and, and film. And I'd, I'd heard from one of the other dancers all oh, about the Batman and uh, that said they'd seen, um, you know, Jerry Hall, which I found really, really exciting. Oh, and, and then isn't that so uncanny and so coincidental that I'm there filming Pride of Batman and then I'm there actually on that fantastic uh, film set. It, it was just magnificent. So, yeah, ultra, ultra excited, but, but try to manage it in a cool and calm and collected way. That try is your best too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, I think, you know, they, they were just such a great team. The, the wardrobe team were lovely. And we became very good friends during and after filming. And I, I think that's a, that's a special thing as well. Because sometimes with with filming, you, you can work on something. And, yeah, you can all get on, but it, it, it can be over and then that's it. But I actually did stay in touch and I went on social outings and gatherings with with the wardrobe people and i think that was so special and even now you know i i keep in touch with vin through the social media and i was disappointed i didn't get to see her recently at a, at a mutual friends um sort of service if you like they, they sadly passed away and we were we were meant to meet up but we still keep in touch and i think that's really special that's that's something 
we don't hear a lot. So it's like, we'll, we'll talk to people. And most of the time it's, they, they talk about people, how they were and how they like at the time we got, we got along. I haven't seen them in 30 years. And so it's incredible. It's lovely, isn't it? I think that shows a great, great spirit, doesn't it? And a, and a great um, respect for, for one another and appreciation that, um, you know, I always had that with, with all of them. And, uh, you know, I think they so wished for me in many ways for me to have done returns, but because um, I was getting some inside inside information from they, uh, especially who worked on on the returns. But you know, these things are mapped out in some ways, and, and you can't change that destiny. You know, I think you know that there were several things that were going on that looked as though I'd be a dead cert for, for that sequel but uh, for some reason the, the stars were not quite aligned or the gods were, were not um, you know holding hands for me on that, on that sequel so it took me in another direction and you know I'm always grateful for for what I've experienced and, and other things so um, you know if, if someone had said to me well look you can do the first one or the sequel I would have always gone for the first because it's it's so iconic isn't it right and you got to be a, a big part of a lot of those iconic scenes right so you were the first appearance and then yes yeah I mean that was just like unbelievable really um you know, that very first shot where he lands on the rooftop, you know, with, with the muggers. And uh, I can just picture it now with the guys sort of winching me up uh, with my, with the Kirby wires and the harness on and just winching me up and then, you know, getting that perfect timing to, to sort of fly me in at the right speed and, and angle. Um, I mean, as has been discovered on... Uh, previous podcasts and things is is the, the real sad thing was that I had an even earlier sequence which is where I was crouched with the gargoyles on on the roof on the top of uh, the cathedral uh, and that was just so sad that that scene got deleted because I still believe and, and many fans and appreciators just feel that that would have been absolutely amazing to have witnessed that rather than using the, the animation that I think was, was poor. You know, I didn't think it had the same flow and the same context of the movie, whereas you've got that beautifully lit uh, gothic scene with me and, and you're just wondering, and then I'm doing these minimal movements. And it took a lot of dedication and, and hard work to, to keep a nice pose there. But... I still have to be very grateful, don't I, that I got that lovely scene of that beautiful silhouette being made where I land very softly and then the, the, the cake comes down slowly and then you hear that crunching sound and, and the muggers look up and then that's when I take off. You know, yeah. and just, again, spreading the cape, menacing and sort of jumping down to get closer to them. And then Michael does that sort of flat down um at the very end of that um and, and carries on where he, he delivers that that kick that famous kick or, or sean certainly did anyway sean mccabe did that kick but uh, it was wonderful it's i mean it's just amazing to think about you're you're talking about working with michael and we're just sitting here like that's michael keaton um and it, <laughs> it's just it's it's crazy it is crazy so what, yeah, <laughs> like I've been I've been watching that guy in movies since I was you know old enough to watch movies, and it's it's just crazy. He's, he's brilliant. He's, I mean, he is a brilliant actor, and again, I I'd seen Michael's work. Um, I mean, he's so versatile, isn't he? And uh, you know, Pacific Heights with Matthew Modine, and of course, Beetlejuice, and, and many, Mr. Mom, many others. But he is absolutely brilliant. He's a lovely guy as well, and. Um, you know, as, as I keep saying on various things, that it, it was the most wonderful mix, you know, to have me as a, as a ballet dancer, as a movement double, and then you got the two stunt doubles, and then they reshot the, the fighting sequences with Dave Lee. But, I mean, the, there was just that wonderful blend of everyone, and I think Michael did a great job. I mean, you know, he looked great. His voice was perfect. 
He was a great Bruce Wayne as well. And uh, I totally admire and respect him. I think he's a terrific actor. And, and to have him with Jack and Kim, you know, and, and everybody else, it, it was a beautiful cast. It really was. And the chemistry shows up so well on screen. Um, That's great. So, so the movement double aspect of it, I, I've read and heard through other interviews you've done and doing research that that was mainly because this, they brought you in mainly because it was almost impossible to move in that suit. And so they, they needed you to add like the athleticism to it. Or is there another reason yeah. behind that? Yeah, I mean, that that was very much it because, you know, if, if we think about it, um, Sean, the late Sean, you know, so sad he, he passed so young as well. But um, Sean was in there first because I think possibly, you know, when they cast this movie, they thought, well, OK, Michael isn't your typical sort of Stallone, you know, Schwarzenegger, you know, Van Damme type. but you know, he'll do great. We've got the suits and then we can get a really good, because I mean, stunt guys train, as we know, in so many different aspects, don't they? You know, they can be good at horse riding. They can be good at fighting, falling, the whole thing, driving. Um, so they must have felt initially that, that Sean was right. But then it did miss that fluidity because, um, yes, the suit was very restricting. Uh, it was very thick. And it definitely missed something in order for them to say, we, we need to get a dancer in here. You know, um, I think sometimes, you know, in these documentaries that you see on YouTube, and I know Peter McDonald, I mean, he, he didn't really sell me too well. He just said, I did the walking. Well, I did far more than walking, like, as you know. But I, I think um, it, it just lacked that fluidity and grace and, and elegance and all those things, because, you know, you can be in a suit, and you, you can be a, a stocky sort of muscular guy or whatever, but you still don't necessarily hold yourself and move the same way as a dancer because we've all been taught that lift, you know, keeping the shoulders back and it's like you're being lifted from the bucket. There's a ring in the chest which lifts you, you know, keeps you very elegant and, and poised. So I think, yeah, I, I came in, I was able to add that much needed elegance and athleticism that was was missing because it was very much illustrated when in the bell tower scene um i'd done a lot of work there that was probably one of my biggest scenes you know the initiation coming out in the bat wing and and it sort of interjects between me and michael coming out of the crash the wreckage and then getting to the cathedral doors etc etc and then I remember doing quite a bit where I'd come out of, I'd open the trap door, come out, of course, all the close-ups are, are Michael, but then all the other movement is me. And then I'd done quite a bit. Then they thought, right, this is the, the bit. Now we need to get Dave Lee in to do the fighting. And, and he had done that. And then he tried to carry on and, and move the way I could, but he, he just couldn't do it. I mean, that's no disrespect to, to Dave. I mean, he was terrific at what he did, but it just shows you the differences in in how people could handle that suit. You know, and you think he did brilliant for being able to move the way he did in a fighting aspect in the suit. But with regards to grace and elegance and all of that, it, they just couldn't do it because Peter McDonald called me back to, back in and then I did some more walking and I did a lot of the stalking with the Joker etc so I think what it all alludes back to if you like is that this was like a dream magic role for me to get because I, I'd got all these things in in my makeup but you know my like bag of tricks if you like where I'd done so much sport I, I'd done all the dance for many years I'd performed an awful lot and so really that that gave me that that lovely um facet of, of Batman and then Sean did all these other great things uh, as well and then Dave did his thing and, and Michael of course so I think it was that perfect blend of everything that it it made it so unique that that we all were needed um and it worked so beautifully 
It, it definitely did. It's kind of funny to think about that, that scene where you're stalking the Joker and how, like, it, I mean, it's tough to imagine that there are four people in, in that suit at the, in that scene because you, you don't see it. And it, it's incredibly impressive how it all cuts together. And yeah, honestly, it, it was it, like you said, it blended really well. So as far as like the suit itself, it, it, I mean, it's become notorious over the years, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you couldn't turn your head. It was almost couldn't throw a punch. Like what were some of the limitations that you found in the suit that you were able to kind of work around because of your background dancing? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that that's probably come out an awful lot through these documentaries and, and conversations is, is because the cowl was pulled down tight and glued onto the cape that that was incredibly restricting i mean i i didn't find the actual um suit itself uh too bad at all you know because i i'd worn so many costumes i'd i'd worn you know in in period dramas i'd i'd done quite a lot of dance work and, and things and and you can wear some very very fitted costumes but that that was the worst aspect was was the fact of the, the cowl being pulled down tight and glued to the cape and say that did give that restricted movement. But I think, you know, that the thing with dancers are, is they are real masochists, you know, that they, they take the pain, they take the restrictions, they'll, they'll just get on with it. And I, I just did the same. I mean, I, I think if you have that psychological thing of thinking, God, it's really hot, isn't it? And, and all this is really <laughs> tight. It, it is a thing that can actually make you feel even more uncomfortable and, and um, probably feeling like you've not got much breath or anything else. But I, I was able to, it's that dedication thing again of, of getting into that zone of thinking, you know, this is nothing. I, I, I can manage this. It, it might not move the, the way um, I, I would ideally want to it if, if it was a much thinner nylon or something like that a different material but no I think the way I overcame it was that um you know dancers we're, we're very supple anyway um you know and I, I would do lots of warm-up exercises you know and through the neck and the shoulders as well and do the best I mean you can only do uh, the, the very best you can with 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 the costume but I I didn't allow it to restrict me to stop me I I just think I just felt so incredible in that costume anyway. You can imagine, can't you? I mean, that that kind of strength and, and presence that it gave you and that gorgeous belt and, and then the cape and I could do all these lovely swishing uh, cape popping movements as well. Um, you know, it, it was just a dream come true to, to get a costume like that, you know. So, yeah, I I, I didn't find it a problem at all. Wow, I, that is, I, I've never really heard that with the with the dancing and how it, I, I guess I've never really thought about how compressing all that is. Um, yeah, I mean, but the, there's a very good um, example I can give you, Grant, which is um, Day Merge, who had worked on, I think it could have been the Greystoke movie. I well, he certainly worked on a movie where, there was a lot of actors that were were in ape, you know, playing apes, and they had those specific uh, costumes. I mean, I'd, I'd have loved to have done something like that as well because I love how athletic and, and nimble they were. But he said to me, you know, not without blowing my own trumpet, it's not for that at all. It's just to show my my kind of commitment. And he said, I just can't believe you, Carl. You never complain about anything. He said, I had these actors, you know, they were there and they couldn't wait to rip the costumes off and they were complaining about being hot and you know I could see that it was making it worse in a sense but he said you just you just get on with it you never complain you just do it um and I said oh thank you thank you for that but I just feel that's the way it should be you know no no prima donnas here you know sort of uh thinking you're above anything <laughs> just to get on with it you know just enjoy it um, as I say, I, I was a masochist anyway. I used to train such a lot with with, with my dance and with my fitness and things. And um, yeah, I, I just absolutely took it with both hands and, and ran with it. 
you, you said no prima donnas there as you're working with you know jack jack nicholson and, and all, <laughs> yes. like some of the biggest stars hollywood's ever had <laughs> i know i know i mean i i'd always had um you know because people say well you know did you do this or did you know did you talk to them and it, it's just i mean i think if if you do a sequel or if you do more things you, you build up that kind of rapport i mean we certainly had a very good rapport but i i think everybody's getting their job done and, and the specifics and the way the schedules work is that, you know, there was times I wasn't even near Michael, you know, he, he'd be doing his stuff and I'd be over in a different part of the stage or whatever. But we, we all have that um, wonderful respect and, and appreciation for one another. And when I got the opportunities, when I could watch Jack, you know, during filming and do his takes, that was magnificent because he was so professional, as as Michael was as well. But you know, he, he could get those lines. I mean, the charisma and all those things. And he was an actor I, I greatly admired. And my late parents were were huge fans, and my family were as well. You know, of, of his versatility and the great roles he played. But I think, um, you know, all in all, considering how the schedules were the different parts and, and what we were doing we the times that we did get together you know and i spent quite a bit of time with kim during some of the scenes she was so lovely uh, and, and jack i mean jack and, and michael got these nicknames for me which i was very flattered by but um you know th there was a lovely sort of um, chemistry and respect as i say with, with one another so it was fantastic that I mean, I've, uh, Jack Nicholson in, is just one I've been looking up to forever. I couldn't imagine even like sharing a stage, like even that mile and a half where you, where you talk about that stage being. I couldn't imagine being in that same mile, like doing the no. same thing. Oh. It's impressive. Well, the thing was, I I'd gone to this amazing party. I think this is before um, I was doing some stuff with Jack, and and I'd said to his dresser, I said, look, I, I, all I want to do is just kind of like an icebreaker. I just want to say hello. I'm not going to overstep my mark, you know, because I always respect people's privacy and, and everything else. And uh, I said to Dave, look, I, I really, and, and he sort of arranged it. And we, we just kind of acknowledged one another. And, and that was all it needed, really, just that we, we knew who each other was. And that was a very relaxed um, party. It was fantastic, really, because Michael was there as well. Um, but, you know, it, it's fascinating, really, that's like behind the scenes stuff, because I think you may have heard before, I, I fell madly in love with someone who was who was working on the movie and she had had um, the, the placement um, with with Vin um, on, on this movie. And um, it was the last thing she would sort of tried. So it was kind of fate that we were drawn together. But I think what gave me another even more big boost was that um, Jack, Jack was very, very enamoured with her because she was a very beautiful, unique um, lady who had done incredible um, in the design world. And sadly, you know, she, she passed only a few years ago. But it, it just gave me a really uh, fantastic boost where I thought, well, I've got someone like Jack Nicholson that's... Um, you know, very enamoured with my lady and, and Batman won through the day. So <laughs> Batman won through twice, not only through the movie, but but with that as well. So that was that was really quite funny, actually. But yeah, he, he was great. He really was great. That That's the story. I, ha I actually hadn't heard that. That is, I mean, congratulations, Batman. Um... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the film had all these you know th this film had everything for me because it, it, it uh, introduced me to a wonderful lady and all right we, we had two years but they were they were incredible two years but then I had I had the meeting with Prince where sadly um, I never managed to get him to, to communicate as such with me but he paid me the, the highest honor when he put the picture of me in the bell tower in the or his team did any way in, in the cd uh booklet um but you know i had all these amazing things like, like that you know that that uh, i was given great things from from the movie i got one of the original chest plates uh from john evans special effects uh, supervisor and bob ringwood was very close to giving me a beautiful um picture 
Um, but of course, I got the Herberts pictures and all the other stuff. And um, you know, there was so much that came with with the movie. You know, just the friendships and everything else. So it, it, it's it's a great part of my life that that I shall cherish forever. You know, it, it's maybe thirty three years old, but as you can probably tell with how passionate I am talking about it, 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 it means such a great deal to me because, you know, I think in life it's about quality rather than quantity. Uh, I've never been a greedy person. That There's um, been these opportunities that I've, I've missed out on. I've been at very close calls. But then something like Batman comes along and it can just wash away all those kind of frustrations and uh, disappointments away. Um, and it just feels so eternally grateful for, for having that opportunity and and just, you know, meeting and, and, and sharing wonderful um, moments with the fans, you know, and everybody else. It's, it's wonderful. That's incredible. I, I guess you're still meeting fans 33 years later. Um, I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, literally right here. I guess my, my next question just has to do with, did y'all know immediately that this movie was going to be iconic or was there a certain point during the filming or just when you saw it? Well, at what point did you realize how iconic the movie would become? Well, you had that good faith with having all these magic ingredients coming together, you know, having the Prince, the Danny Elfman soundtrack, having Jack Nicholson and Michael and Kim uh, having the the wonderful design but I suppose you know you, you're just hoping that everybody embraces it because with with Michael being quite a unique choice in that sense but I, I think you know you get very much in the zone you, you keep busy you're doing the best possible job that you can do um, you just have the faith, basically. But then when that bat, that 1989 Batmania uh, went and then I felt it, you know, right the way, you know, I just go out with the Batman jacket on that I was given and, and all these wonderful things, just the, the hype and the excitement. And, and then that was when you realise this this is going to be massive. Wow. So I think, it, yeah, I think initially you, you had the faith, but but there's a little bit of precaution there, of course, you know. But but then, uh, as we know, it, it just it just was so huge, and it, it still is so huge. It, it's... it is still so huge. Yes, I mean, even now, you know, it, it's. I think what's great is that parents are getting their kids to see it, and you know, keeping that just perpetually going you know because it will always be considered so iconic and and the gold standard the benchmark for all the other movies that subsequently came out right and you still meet people who talk about michael keaton's their favorite batman 1989 is their favorite batman movie and we are 33 years and dozen almost a dozen batman movies removed that, that says something doesn't it it really does it really does so I guess kind of moving out of Batman, I, I'm curious to know what your careers look like since since you donned the cowl. Yes, well, I did, as I say, we, we, we went on a different journey with the returns not happening for me. That, that was kind of um, so many different elements. I, I had this fantastic chat with Tim at a, a rap party and, and he was asking you know if I'd worked in America but um, you know so so what I did basically because I didn't do the returns I I, I went to see Danny Cannon for Judge Dredd I went to go up for Eyes Wide Shut the, the Stanley Kubrick but I was steadily working doing my usual things which were I was doing these big trade shows around Europe where cars were being launched uh, and there were big extravaganzas with dancers and stunt drivers and aerial artists and those kind of things. I did a whole variety of things, lots of commercials, some big co commercials for America, very successful um, TV, working with a lot of um, 
different uh, comedy acts that, that we have here in Britain that were very, very popular. Did so much of that. Uh, you know, the whole realm, really. And, and also was trying to get the drumming going again. And I was playing with a band, a singer songwriter as well, and there was potential about getting a record deal. Then I met some amazing American producers that were living in London. They'd both been very successful here in London. Um, I got, uh, I got with the um, Spice Girls singing coach. Would you believe uh, there was uh, talk of me? doing something with singing and drumming um, and then I got introduced to to people with uh, doing some voiceover work I was very interested in uh, broadcasting as well um, I then went to America quite some years down down the track that was in 99 and I was doing some work over there I was doing some choreography I, I was acting a bit and dancing a bit there. I was also playing with a band. There was all these things going on. I mean, I was always um, getting getting on really well and then getting just pipped at the post. I think Singapore Radio were very interested in me at one time and then I just missed out on that. Um, I came back to the UK in 2001 and um, I saw a very, very big... Uh, potential job just in a magazine called Time Out, which was the magazine I used to subscribe to when I lived in London, gives you the overall picture of what's going on. Um, and I got this massive kind of PR uh, it's experiment, but it, it was a fantastic idea of getting a fictitious family in in Harrods windows you know the biggest store most world famous store there um and launching showcasing this latest technology to the world which was the Korean based company LG and I'd been familiar with LG in Australia so I knew a lot about that and then got this fantastic opportunity and um we were giving radio and TV interviews to, to so many people from all around the world. I mean, I gave a press conference, I think, to 60 journalists from around the world. And, you know, that was going to be a big launch for me doing a different kind of thing, because I'd always been interested in, in acting and broadcasting as well. And um, it seemed to get this massive kind of response. And then <laughs> things can happen. I think I did one job, uh, which was a big, uh, job that uh, big thing over in the UK was was a program called Tomorrow's World, which sort of had all the technology and, and information for people. It was a fantastic show. I, I did a big thing with them, and then it kind of, you know, it was weird how things can go. Sometimes you get these real peaks and troughs. Um, I did work with some other radio stations. I helped with a youth radio station, and then. I was getting a little bit frustrated uh, with, with stuff. I started a family, I had two beautiful daughters, and then I went back to one of my other loves, which is um, I grew up on a, a neighbouring farm, a local farm near to where the family home was, and I wanted to educate children, so I took a lot of schools um, around educating them about the, the field to fork, uh, way you know with food growing and, and food and was driving to something very normal to, to my film career and stuff I was driving the tractor and I was taking all these different groups round and um, supporting local growers and suppliers um, so that that you know I'm, I'm a very a very much a, a multifaceted kind of guy you know that I love so many things in life which I think is is the way I am anyway and it's made my life so much more enriching um, and even now you know I, I love all that kind of stuff uh, you know I grew up with my parents and my grandparents growing things and it's it's all part of what I love you know really um, I think now I've got the the hunger again to um, get the suit back on and maybe do some appearances and some cons or whatever. I've been enjoying doing all these lovely podcasts. But, you know, I'd just like to say that I'm an all round guy that, that 
loves nature and um, helping one another and supporting one another. Say, I've I've loved helping children learn more because it's things that have been forgotten over years. Um, and, and bringing that sort of wealth of, of, of knowledge and, and interest that I have on that side. That is incredible. Um, just absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm sure you've impacted a lot of lives and to, you know, get a lot of young farmers. I, I grew up, my, my grandparents had a, had a farm, farmland and a garden. And so I, I grew up helping and I completely can understand that, that love for nature. That's fantastic. No, that's wonderful. I mean, I, I think, you know, you, you find in many ways, you know, you can get, is it Sam Neill that, that's the, the uh, Kiwi uh, actor that's got a, I think he's got a vineyard and a, and a farm in, in New Zealand. I'm sure that's right. But I think, you know, if you're that kind of wholesome type of person that, you know, I've always loved nature and and that ethos if you like and yes i i was very lucky that both my parents were the 50s was their era and i that really washed off on me so i loved all those 50s kind of actors and actresses and and the people like gene kelly and fred astaire all those beautiful things it just seems such a happy joyous time you know there was great skills that these people had and and that lovely respect for one another so i grew up with all of that a, a, a love of of great music as well i mean i'm not frightened to say i love nat king cole and frank sinatra as well as all the other more modern stuff you know i was exposed to led zeppelin and pink floyd and and everything and and i've got a rich palette of music that i love um, I'm a big lover of, of jazz, Miles Davis and, and all these great people as well. So I've got all this richness inside me, but I've always believed in, in you know, helping one another and, you know, inspiring others, you know. So I've helped um, a lot of people along the way. I've given them opportunities in, in showbiz, you know, I've supported dancers and given them opportunities because choreographers have hired me and then said, oh, we need a such and such girl or, or whatever to work with you. Um, and just encouraging, encouraging young people, you know, because there's a lot of this that they're lost in a way. They don't know where to go or they, they, they need inspiration, motivation. Um, I love doing that as well with people and uh, getting helping people with with the food as well, you know, and saying, look, you know, grow a bit of stuff yourself or you know learn more what you're putting into yourself uh, where it's coming from you know it, it's all great stuff really and it, I, I love it when you see programs or learn about people that are doing that they're getting some chickens I mean Rachel who, who's my lady she's fantastic she's had lots of chickens over the years she grows a lot of her own veg um it's just really interesting you know it's another part of life isn't it that um is there you know and i embrace it all i really do i'm an all-round kind of guy that is honestly not at all what i expected <laughs> after after the batman conversation but that is absolutely just wonderful yeah i mean i, I just think you know it, it makes you very rounded um you know I, I think it's very sad when people come off the rails and um you know you think of all that talent and and all of that waste in a way and i i don't think there's anything wrong with with just having an appreciation of of nature and 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 people especially you know just just helping people and um you know make, making the most because we live in such a fast world now people don't spend time to talk or interact you know, I think you can bring your warmth and your generosity and your kindness to, to people as well, which I think is the most important thing that, that giving people that because, you know, we, we're never really around for that long. But if we can touch people, if we can make a difference and uh, that, that means an awful lot to me, really. I, I wholeheartedly agree, and it's it's good to see a, a life that has been dedicated to that, all the fruits that it brings. So, 
thank you thank for, for sharing sharing that with the world literal fruits yeah because right. i think you know it, it's very sad when you can get you know the, this side of people which is constantly fixated with with money and materialism but you know i mean as, as steve jobs that great philosophy that the great steve jobs had you know you can be a billionaire like he was but if you haven't got your health you know then it means nothing but it's what it's really saying is which is what i've always believed in and right from a young age i've always just loved life you know i've always just had that zest and that passion for life and for people so that you know the, the time we're here if, if you can just share and, and enjoy that and yeah and you get the successes along the way like i've had with with the batman and various other things but it's never taken away my love of of people and and just kindness and 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 helping and whatever you know just just to make it even more beautiful really in that way uh, because i say if you've got all the money and the materialism and you, you don't give then it's a sad world in my my way anyway in my eyes that's it's a good way to live life and i i think that I think that if more people thought that way, we'd live in a much better world. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, just just to give you a few quick things, what what I've found in my life is because of my 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 personality, if you like, that there's there's been these because I've always like with a friend of mine, he said, well, you you be the good Samaritan. You you don't do you don't do things to to get back, you know. But but if you do good things, it's amazing what can happen down the line and I've, I've found that very much just being myself and just having warmth and, and being genuine to people it's rewarded me down the line where I remember when I was waiting to go and see a fantastic Leonardo um, exhibition Da Vinci exhibition and uh, it was sold out uh, and then somebody uh, offered me a ticket you know and, and then there's been things where I've been wanted to I went to Larry Carlton you know fantastic American guitarist that played with Steely Dan great session uh, guitarist uh, I was going to see him and I was I was just literally going to the gig and then someone offered me the meet and greet part of the ticket and it's just I think it's just an energy that you give off if you're somebody that's that's warm and, and open and, and friendly you know you're not doing anything for the sake of it but but good things do come back to you because you're just that way yourself you know you, you help others and you you just want to make life better in many ways so it's it's very interesting that wow that is you know i was not expecting to such like life advice in, the, in this <laughs> and now it's like, well, I'm getting, this is going to be like all the promotion, right? It's like this, this is how you should live your life, everybody. Um, yeah, well, we try, we try, don't we? If if we can just make a difference, and uh, you know, kindness costs nothing, as they say, and and you know, just, just, I mean, we know that that life is is complex, and uh, you know, there's lots of frustrations and things, but I think you you just navigate through it, and and just make time better for yourself and for others you know within that so that, that's the way i look at it well thank you very much for that and thank you so much for coming on it has been an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you well it's been uh, my pleasure too to speak to both of you as well